Okay, everybody, welcome back to um, we're, uh, this next panel. We're really lucky to um, invite this uh, amazing panel and leader. So this is a panel on entrepreneurship and venture at Berkeley, and it's hosted by Professor Rich Lyons. And I'm going to briefly introduce Rich, who is going to briefly introduce the panelists. Uh, Rich Lyons served as Dean of UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business from 2008 to 2018, and he's currently the William and Janet Cronk Chair in Innovation Leadership. As Dean of the Haas School, Rich led a sweeping culture initiative that drove the school's historic strengths more deeply into admissions and other critical processes, with a set of four defining leadership principles. Question the status quo, We've heard about that already today quite a bit. Confidence without attitude. I like that one a lot. Mm. Students always and beyond yourself. He oversaw the development of the um, Connie and Kevin Chu Hall, a new academic building funded entirely by alumni and friends, as well as attracting eight of the 10 largest gifts in school, hit, in school history. He also forged stronger ties with other UC Berkeley colleges and departments, and engineering um, and ECS has really been a beneficiary of this, with a focus on dual degree programs combining business with STEM fields, and that includes the new Management, Entrepreneurship, and Technology, or MET program with Berkeley Engineering. For two years prior, just prior to serving as dean, he was the chief learning officer at Goldman Sachs. Rich received his BS with highest honors from UC Berkeley in finance and PhD from MIT in economics. Uh, before joining Berkeley, he was six years on the faculty at the Columbia Business School. His research and teaching expertise is in international finance, and his top um, applied interest is the how and why of setting strong cultures in organizations. In January of 2020, Rich began a new campus-wide role as UC Berkeley Chief Innovation and Entrepreneurship Officer. In this new role, he oversees development of the campus-wide ecosystem for innovation and entrepreneurship, including patenting and technology licensing. So please welcome Rich and the rest of Rich's panel. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, and thank you for the opportunity. So the, so the talent is, is to my right here, overseeing the ecosystem for innovation and entrepreneurship. You know, Berkeley's genius is in its distributed creativity, right? So uh, we do our best to, to pull things together to make them more than the sum of the parts, but the action is, is at the ground level. It's at, it's at EECS and it's, it's everywhere in engineering and elsewhere as well. So I'm gonna do, um, Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm going to be a little more brief with, with five panelists here, and, the, and, and we could go on with all of them really quite long, but I'll, I'll give you a quick introduction of each. The topic here today is, you know, what do we love about Berkeley Eeks and Berkeley Eeks uh, founders? And, and we'll have different variations on that, but that's, that's really the, the starting point here, and all of these, have, all of these uh, wonderful panelists have, have things to say. So I'll start with Caroline on that end of the, of the bench. Caroline Winnett is a friend and colleague. She runs Skydeck, the largest of our campus accelerators. Most of you know that. She's a founder herself, co-founder, a neuromarketing company called NeuroFocus that had a, a fine exit, and she's really advanced Skydeck and the whole ecosystem a, a remarkable amount in, in her getting close to 10 years of leadership at Skydeck. So we, we thank you very much for that, Caroline. She's, uh, did I say she's a Berkeley MBA uh, uh, alum? Uh, number two, uh, Cameron Broder, partner of the House Fund. Most of you are familiar with the House Fund. EEX grad, uh, investor in many EEX startups, large and small. Uh, and EEX uh, entrepreneurs very commonly point to the House as having been a really fundamental partner for them. So thanks for all that you and uh, and Jeremy have, have built there for, for us. Uh, third on the list here, J Lenny. Lenny Press, a par partner at Amplify. Uh, EECS uh, CS in particular grad, investor in Ions Inescale and others. Amplify has shown the longest lasting commitment to fund EECS entrepreneurial mixers and many other things in, in their, their connections here. So the, uh, then uh, Amit. Uh, Amit is 
a partner, excuse me, I just uh, got rid of my notes here. Um, Anit is a partner at Excel, Eeksgrad, um, pointed out in the notes that were sent to me, star of one of my uh, undergraduate classes, so very clearly you distinguished yourself here, successful entrepreneur, liaison to Axel Scholars program, and, uh, and, and other, other contributions, of course, and connectivity. And, and Andy, last but not least, partner, a computer science graduate venture fund, Eeksgrad, PhD, grad, uh, co-founder Databricks, founder Perplexity AI, workhorse behind the current EECS entrepreneurship course, not to take away from, from the instructors uh, of, of record in that class. So all five of you, thank you for being here. And we'll, we'll just jump in. We thought we would start with just quick comments on, on that, that question. What, what do I love about EECS and, and EECS founders? And we'll, we'll take this sort of wherever we all want to take it. But if I may start with you, Caroline, Eeks and Eeks founders. Love all of them, <laughs> and let me tell you why. Uh, why. Why is Berkeley entrepreneurship exploding in the most fantastic way? And it's because of the people here, the people in this room, it's because of talent, period. You can't have a great ecosystem without talent, and I think it's safe to say there is a boatload of talent here. Right? Now you can have a lot of talent, but if you don't have the right mindset, that talent will go off and do sort of more modest things. But there is a, a thinking here at Berkeley uh, that I know we all share, which is we don't want to be good, we don't want to be great, we want to be the absolute best. And that combination of that world-changing mindset and talent, that's what makes us magical. Super. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Um, anybody wants to go next? Go ahead, jump in. We don't. I'll go ahead, uh, keep things in order here yep. for now. Um, and I'm sure we're gonna talk about the culture a lot today, and there's a lot of different angles to approach the culture from at Berkeley Eeks, but um, I'll, I'll just start it off. You know, uh, this is a really tough program to get through. Yeah. You know, as a student that went through the undergraduate Eeks program, it's, uh, it's really damn hard. And you learn over the course of four years what really hard work looks like in, in an economic uh, in an academic context um, and you learn that you know even just to be a notch above average you've got to work really hard for a really long time really consistently for four years apply um, uh, apply a lot of focus and figure out how to prioritize your time and nothing's handed to you you've got to earn every inch in a place like Berkeley um, you know just getting your classes <laughs> can be a struggle the class you need to graduate. And that's, you know, juxtapose that with the type of experience you get at, you know, some of our private peer institutions. It's very different. And so when Berkeley eeks entrepreneurs, and I think part of what I'm saying applies more broadly to Berkeley, but is magnified in the eeks department, just given the caliber and the talent of students here and the rigor of the program, you, um, you, know, you get actually really great entrepreneurs that come out of this program because they've learned how to work, they learn, learn how to prioritize, they're, they're wicked smart. Um, and they have that uh, ability to never assume something's going to be handed to them. They've got to figure it out, and that's um, you know at the essence of what it means to be an entrepreneur. Love it. Thanks for that. Yeah, no, just to just to go off of what Cameron uh, uh, said, he, he nailed that startups are a meat grinder, uh, and we've been fortunate to have uh, backed four at least four Berkeley teams in the last three four years, uh, and just the the how ready those folks are to take on the day-to-day -day challenges of, of working in a startup, solving not just in technical engineering problems, product problems, uh, organizational challenges. Uh, it speaks to the quality of the folks, the quality of the, of the program here. And we find that Berkeley, Berkeley entrepreneurs are some of the most ready to face the, the challenges of, of building, building a business in today's environment. Thanks for that, Lenny. You know, I was talking with Jeremy right before this and we were remarking Berkeley students are still the underdog. You know, even though the ecosystem is so successful and we have such great entrepreneurs, people keep overlooking Berkeley. And I think uh, it's easy when you have the, the sort of the big brother sibling, let's call it, uh, <laughs> down in Palo Alto. But Berkeley kids come out of here with a chip on their shoulder. And I think that's like the biggest asset you can have. Um, you know, I don't think anything is handed to you here. You really have to go out and get it. Berkeley's a world-class institution. You can have any kind of education you want. You gotta go get it, it's not like handing on a plate to you. I don't think someone shows up at your dorm and is like, hey, here's what you should do. You gotta go out and get it, and I think um, 
you know, that chip on your shoulders, it's a, it's a really powerful, really powerful uh, mechanism. I think vision is the word that comes to mind first. Mm -hmm. Berkeley folks think 10 years into the future. It's in the faculty, it's in the students' projects, it's in the papers that even undergrads get exposed to. Um, it's in the air. So I think one of the things that make world-defining startups is the ability for the founders to see something before everybody else and, and execute against that. I mean, you, you need both. You need vision and you need execution. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I think that the thing that differentiates, uh, in my opinion, the startups that I look at coming out of Berkeley is that they've inherited this sense of vision for seeing where the puck is going and meeting it there, um, building the company just at the right time and the company that, that can change the world uh, you know, in the next five and 10 years. Thanks for, you know, I mean, lots of very big and, and important topics. Um, you know, uh, when thinking about culture, thinking about talent, uh, thinking about, you know, mindset, which, which obviously was part of what everybody said, and also, also vision. You know, I, 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 it was John Riccatello, who's one of our alums, longtime CEO of Electronic Arts and um, Unity Technologies. Anyways, I, he so many times uses the word, the word paint, or the phrase, paint the picture, right? It's, it's like the vision, but, but see, being able to see it and then articulate it. It's like, imagine in three years it looks like this. Bang. Really? Wow, there are a lot of steps you've seen here and there, but you just painted something that looks very interesting. So there's, there's that sight and also that ability to articulate the sight, right? And I think, um, I think our students are quite, and faculty are quite, quite, quite good at that. Let, let's dig into a couple. How about this? The, the sort of trends. Are you seeing, I think all the things you are saying are true. I think we might have said them 10 years ago. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, do you think they're getting stronger? Could we be more intentional about making them stronger if they're that important an asset? Any, any thoughts? I'll talk about a trend, okay. uh, which is maybe a little divorced from what, what I uh, led with, which is you know, going back you know, a dozen or so years to when, when I was a student on campus, you know, the, the folks who were interested in startups were working in different Dungeness corners of, uh, of the campus, whatever uh, literally janitorial closet they could sneak their way into, that, that was their home base. And if they got really serious, they would drop out, they would join something like Y Combinator, and that was their kind of stepping stone. And there wasn't much, uh, it wasn't really understood to be an option at the time to start a company uh, beyond, you know, a very small set of people who were, were hungry for exactly that and came here with, with that in mind. You know, today, uh, you know, fast forward 12 years, it's, it's a very different campus. There's a handful, not just one, but a handful of student-run accelerators. Um, of course, there's all the infrastructure uh, run by the campus itself, but just, you know, it, it's in the water. Students are choosing to spend their time not just working on projects, but building infrastructure for other students to work within. Um, it's hard to avoid today, I think particularly within Berkeley Eeks. Um, you know, the idea that starting a company is is not just okay, but maybe an excellent path. And, you know, at least our mindset as, you know, venture capitalists isn't for every student to leave this place and start a company, but to understand that it's an option. Uh, and if it's not today, uh, maybe it's 10 years from now or 20 years from now, it's in the back of your mind. And, you know, maybe you try it and realize it's not what you want. That's also fine. Um, just to realize it's, it's on the menu. And um, that was just really hard to get across or even find peers, yeah. uh, you know, 12, yeah. 15 years ago. Fundamental point, please. Yeah, I have to imagine that entrepreneurship is still exploding. I mean, you can't be what you can't see. And I think that that's something that Stanford has really benefited from. They had a real culture of entrepreneurship and the Yahoo's and the Googles of the world. And I think that created a flywheel of other folks seeking that path out. And, you know, now we have sort of a rising generation of entrepreneurs that are notable, you know, Ryan Peterson from Flexport, you know, the, the, the folks that Lenny was alluding to, uh, Professor Stoika, Professor Abiel, you know, I think these examples, and as people like more clearly affiliate themselves with Berkeley, it creates a flywheel effect, and you see other folks like Tony from DoorDash, you know, what an incredible outcome for us, and so, you know, I think as long as we do a really good job of, of embracing those stories and bringing them back to campus, you're going to see a a huge explosion or a continued explosion and flywheel of the next generation of folks seeing themselves in that uh, and wanting to pursue that path. Mm -hmm. I would add to that that it used to be that we had to go from Berkeley to the South Bay or to wherever, you know, to, to talk to the venture community and here they are, right? So the, the world is coming to us 
Uh, the programs we have at Skydeck, some of them are open to only to Berkeley and UC grads, but some are open to entrepreneurs outside the US and we're attracting incredible talent, like one of our founders here is, <laughs> oh, in our current batch, uh, come to us, comes to us from Armenia. And they become part of Berkeley. You know, the other thing that's been really exciting to see is that we're all now starting to leverage the half a million Berkeley alums around the world who go, wow, there's cool startups coming out of Berkeley. I want to help. We have now 600 advisors and mentors at, at Berkeley Skydeck that have signed an agreement to help our startups pro bono. About 80% of them are Berkeley alums. And I know that everybody else here is now leveraging. How many people here are, are alums and have come to check stuff out, right? It, it's, and you're interested in what's going on in the startup world. And our talent leveraging our alumni talent, that's an incredible recipe. If I, if I could add to that briefly, and then I want to hear more from the rest of you. But we um, created a, a, a website that has a number of documents on it. But one of them is just a one pager. It's like the top 10 sources of venture flow from UC Berkeley, because there are more than 10. But it's like, who's the contact person? What kind of venture flow? Skydeck, of course, is on there. But, but it's like, top 10? Like, how many more than 10 do you have? It's like, so think, things really have changed that way. And just, just as another indicator, um, the, the VCs, not just VCs, but the funders that are really interested in tapping into Berkeley, many of them will also say, this is great. But by the time I'm going to a demo day, I mean, that's a great thing. But I need to get in further upstream. So we created a document and posted it on the web, 100 faculty founders at Berkeley. We've never curated that list. Wow. And, a lot of, and it's up on the website and it's getting tons of social media attention. But part of it is it's like, tell, somebody used the phrase, you have to tell the story for crying out loud, right? <laughs> and people are getting very, very excited. Anyways, other, other comments, trends? Mm -hmm. Or we can move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so, so, you know, one of the things that, that also interests me, I'll just put it on the table now, is like, you know, what, what, what do we love about Berkeley Eeks and Berkeley Founders? Uh, what's great about it? What, what could be even greater about Berkeley Eeks and, and Berkeley Founders? So, so could, you know, if, there, if there's some tweak, I think things are going very, very well. What, what, what might you tweak if you were in one of our seats? Well, I, mean, I could tell you sort of where, where my focus is. You know, as much as people do see themselves going down this path, I think there are many more people who could access it who don't currently feel like it's for them. So I, I run a mentorship program at UC Berkeley called the Excel Scholars. It's one of the things I'm just most proud of. Every year, we get hundreds of applications. I mentor the top 25 to 30 CS students. I've been doing it for six years. I have 162 kids. And I mentor them. And there's no army of elves at Excel, unfortunately. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's mostly me. Um, and you know, a lot of it is finding people who are what I call startup curious and, and embracing them and just being like, hey, this is a path for you. We can help you get a job there and go do your master's degree at Stripe or go do your master's degree at Dropbox. Please, professors in the room, don't hate me. But, um, you know, I think just being slightly more commercial. I'll tell you, like, when I went to school here, which was a while ago, um, you know, all the cool kids were going down academia, and I think we just have to embrace you know, being slightly more commercial and, and, and embrace industry. And I think industry isn't a dirty word, and, you know, people can get, they're just some unbelievable opportunities. I mean, the, the sort of innovation and consequently wealth engine that's been built in Silicon Valley over the last 20 years is like unlike anything I think we've all seen. And I think more of Berkeley should embrace it, and more of Berkeley should be a part of it. And, you know, we have the talent. We have the talent, we have the personalities, we have the ambition, and I think it's, it, oftentimes it's, it's just, not being a part of that world, you know, and I'm an immigrant and, you know, I think, you know, I feel very fortunate that I live in Silicon Valley, but if my family had moved somewhere else, I probably wouldn't have been a part of Silicon Valley. And I think it's, you know, kids from all over the world come to Berkeley to be close or adjacent to Silicon Valley and, you know, finding more conduits to get them in there, I think is super important. Oh, I love that. And it links to one of the earlier comments about identity making, right? A part of this is, can yeah. you see yourself through that lens? Yeah. And you can't be what you can't see, a phrase you used earlier, right? One quick comment on that that relates to something Berkeley Please. is doing, Berkeley Y. You know, words like founder and entrepreneurship, anybody in this room loves them, but, but a lot of 18-year-olds don't see themselves in that, that nomenclature, right? So we created as a campus a program we called Berkeley Changemaker. Mm. Right? And changemaking, it's sort of, if you ask the question, how many Berkeley graduates should be founders, whatever that answer in your head is, it's not going to be over 50% for most people and, and closer to 20 for most. 
But if instead you ask how many of our graduates would be served by thinking more entrepreneurially, like 100, whatever, right? And so how do we make room for the space between those, the answers to those two questions? I think it's a really important piece that you're putting. But let, let's stick with this idea. What, what would you adjust? Yeah, um, actually, idea for you, Rich, as our official herding of the cats on campus. Um, while we don't want a whole bunch of meetings to go to, now that we're kind of back in person after the pandemic, uh, I think we really want to get in the room together, mm. you know, building on what, what Amit said. Let's, let's find a couple of times a year some really juicy events. Bring, bring the VCs, because that's what gets everybody excited. Um, free food and drinks, very important. <laughs> Uh, and, and there are these things happening around, Skydeck has them, you know, the house has them, we do these things, but let's do a bit more, let's all get in the room, you know, let's get a name tag on, you know, and do something clever. Um, and then things happen. Just, just put these talented, cool people in the room and stuff happens. I think the other thing to think about is, um, you know, to Amit's earlier point about founder, you, you want to incept this, the future generation of founders, and the best way to do it is for them to actually experience what it's like being in a startup to see them being built. And so it's really hard to go from, you know, uh, academia to throwing your hat in the ring and starting something. Uh, but there's so many incredible startups out there that are working on some pretty groundbreaking technologies. Um, and creating the hooks, all of those companies are, are thirsty for the talent pool that lives here. And, Finding the, connect, the, the, the connections for them to get here. They don't have the, the talent programs of a Google, of a Cisco. Um, and getting, making sure that they've got access to the talent that lives here, I think, is something that you know, everyone's asking us for. Thank you. I think obsess over the alum who, and give them excuses to come back. Um, I think it will take an obsession. It's natural gravity, at least as an alum, who is coming back a lot. Uh, the natural gravity for someone who goes off into the world, let's say a lot of my co-founders who maybe aren't hanging around campus as much as me, uh, is like you do your, your PhD or your undergrad here and you go get successful. And even if you're, you live 45 minutes from campus, uh, there's gravity to being obsessed with your startup, to be, being wildly successful in that path. Uh, you might come back occasionally, but if, if the administration, the faculty, and everybody obsesses over building those, those connections and increasing the rails for faculty to come back, yeah. give them, I don't care what titles it takes or what opportunities it takes to co-teach or uh, mentorship opportunities, exposure to the students, make them special, uh, make them feel special so that they come back because I can't think of a more powerful uh, tool to enable the students and everybody on campus to, to achieve more, to impact the world than connecting them more deeply to that network. I love it. I love it. And, and you know, Caroline mentioned the advisor network at Skydeck. Skydeck's in a good it's a profound campus asset. There's no two ways about it. And one of the most profound or, or non-replicable parts of it is that advisor network, right? And, and, but but that, there's so many other ways we could develop those kinds of, kinds of assets. Um, it, there are some really phenomenal alums who would love to come back, but to them, Berkeley is a black box, right? And they don't know necessarily how to engage. And if you make it really easy for them to come back or you give them prepackaged, whether it's an event, whether it's a speaking slot at you know one of the one of the major classes, I think you're going to get tremendous um, adoption. Um, you know, but if I don't know, like I pretty well in Kurt's class, I was an okay student. I'm definitely not emailing my other professors and being like, hey, <laughs> you know, let me come back and yeah. speak. Um, but it, you know, I, th I think it's the most powerful thing we can do. To your point, and I think you know, cool, like the VCs can pay for the lunch, <laughs> but I think we are, you know, we're in the business of supporting groundbreaking founders, and I think those are the most inspirational people in our ecosystem, and if you put them in front of students, that's the flywheel. Um, we definitely don't need a lot more VCs, so they shouldn't, <laughs> they shouldn't, they shouldn't hear from that's us and be like, hey, I, yeah, I want that guy's job. No, 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 we want founders, uh, so we want to bring back those folks. How many VCs in the audience? We, we always got to ask that question. <laughs> a, a short little hand raise. <laughs> But, you know, if, if we ran that vision to the <clears throat> limit, right? I mean, yeah. you are, you are, Skydeck, I keep pointing at, at Caroline, but, but you are profoundly enabled by that advisor network, right? I mean, oh, absolutely. That's, that is the competitive separator, right? Yeah. And, and we're used to thinking about how do we build platforms to match people up and bring, bring needs and talent together, right? It's sort of like, what, what would it look like 10 years from now if we took this comment really seriously, right? I, it, it, could, it could be a constellation of... of 
lots of assets that are as valuable as Caroline's. Yeah. Um, why don't we, you know, we have a little bit of time left. I think we, we started a little bit late. We get to, we'll go to at least till quarter after, but maybe 20 after. But I'm sure there's some questions um, from the audience. So, so this panel, please, sir, and you'll have to speak up. I don't know that we have any microphones, but if you could. Very good. So, um, I was just wondering, you know, what do you see different Great. I, I have a thought. I actually really don't, that, that's not something that we, I don't think we think about much. I mean, we're just doing what we do here at Berkeley and the investors will, will come, we tell our story. Um, I don't actually think about that that much. What, what about other folks? I mean, I, I would actually I th say the, sh the, the shoe's on the other foot. I think uh, the folks down south have been trying to replicate some of the success that we've seen here with the mm. AMP Lab, RISE Lab now, and all the, all the labs that are fusing academia and industry because the success that we've had here, I think that's one of the things that's really stood out to me uh, has been the emergence of that model and the success that Berkeley's had with it. And it's just been a wellspring of, of potential, of, of not only potential, but actual founders and, and a ton of in, in innovation and now commercial success as well. Uh, Berkeley, in my mind, is synonymous with deep technical foundational research and innovation. And that's at the academic level, but also more and more uh, at the impact through open source, impact through start, startup and product, and those products tend to come from, take directly inherit from the DNA of being deep technical. So less, less likely in my mind to find the next consumer fad oriented startup and more likely to find something like, you know, that inherits from the fact that we invented the internet essentially and, you know, the, the operating system and it, just the list is extremely long about foundational technology we've created and uh, more and more startups coming out of that lineage. If I may add, consistent with those, those good points, the, the, there's a, an economic historian who, who wrote about, my field's economics, who wrote about challenge response mechanisms, that when you face a challenge, you respond and it makes you stronger. And Berkeley has had to run lean. We've had to run lean relative to a lot of the universities that might have been behind that question. And I think that's part of where the grit culture comes from. It's part of where the, the ability to run lean. It's certainly where I think a lot of the relative lack of entitlement comes from. And so when you start talking about these ingredients and then adding them up, or even the new Berkeley RIC, for those of you that don't know about the Research Infrastructure Commons, the RIC, if you just Google Berkeley RIC, it is a platform for allowing startups to access mass spectrometers and cell sequencers on the Berkeley campus. You can't crowd out faculty and students. But it is earning well over you know, seven-figure revenue for our labs that's going right back into the strength of our labs. And if your lab is overfunded, you're never going to create a RIC, a Berkeley RIC. And Berkeley has. And so anyways, I think out of some, some of these adversity elements, I think if we went back to the first question and replayed the tape, we would start to realize some of those things really are about how Berkeley evolved and, and differently than some other places. Please. Yeah. Up here. Hi, I'm Arinat. I'm coming from Germany, so we don't have this kind of startup culture, um, obviously. Uh, really appreciate the event today and also seeing um, this ambition. And I would like to see from the student perspective, what was the flipping point in your career to not to choose to go to Google or somewhere else, but starting something new for yourself, right? So. Where was the left or right decision? Great question. Um, I'll speak about myself personally and, and with some insights from just the, you know, my peers around me, many of whom from when I was on campus you know, ended up starting companies. Um, you know, it's often very people-centric in, in multiple ways. You know, the first is it's another person, a mentor, uh, someone who you could look up to, and th this came up in, in previous conversation as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's really hard to p you know, pinpoint a singular moment or experience, um, but, you know, oftentimes the individuals that I saw going off to start companies, um, they, they saw it in someone else that they respected, and, you know, that helped enable them to think, I, you know, I, maybe I can do that too. 
Um, of course, there, you know, and many of the folks who are even predisposed to go that route have some innate quality that is going to predispose them to, I think I might be an entrepreneur, or this sounds interesting to me. I, I don't have a boss. I have to solve, you know, every step forward is a new challenge because there's no roadmap for me. There's not a, a set of OKRs handed down from my, you know, manager who's seven, you know, tiers deep in the management layer at Google that tells me which way to push. I have to figure out where to push, how hard to push. Um, and that, I just think, suits some people. It, it speaks to them. Um, and, but, yeah, from there, it's the people. And oftentimes, it's another Berkeley entrepreneur or a student that's a couple years older than them um, that, that shows them it's possible. Um, and some of those folks, you know, many, I had many peers while on campus that uh, graduated and went off to start a company. Um, and it's so diverse the ways that people can be put on that path. Some literally started as a student capstone project. And that was the, the start of their story. Others went and took a job for a couple of years um, you know, and got the bug or felt like they had done their master's perhaps at a stripe wherever it might be and they thought they wanted to give it a swing. So it's, it's so diverse the number of ways you can find yourself on that path. Um, but some combination of just some innate quality and being surrounded by the right people I think is really important. Other, other stories? Uh, I feel underqualified to answer this question because my first job out of school was at Microsoft, which, you know, was pretty much like Google at the time. Um, you know, I, th I think there is a weird thing, though, that happens, right? To, for kids, especially today, to get into Berkeley, everything has effectively gone right, you know? They've gotten the good grades. They've gotten to the good schools. They got the great internships. And I think entrepreneurship is seeking risk and, and, and attempting something which is insanely hard and where failure is like the default option. You know, and I think a lot of I think a lot of students at Berkeley, you know, sort of the way we program them through the school system is to run away from failure and to seek things and be great at them. And we need we need to teach a little bit more about embracing risk and taking chances. And you know, I don't know that. I mean, that's probably something we can try to weave into our curriculum a little bit more. But I think s students, because it's so just insanely competitive to get into places like Berkeley today. Um, they've they've had to be great at everything, and they've they've had to run away from that failure. So I don't know. Well, one one meta comment I'd make is you talk to we talk to a lot of potential founders or future founders, and the question we always ask is why do you want to do this? And if the answer is well, I've always wanted to work for myself, I always wanted to be a founder. Well, we say you shouldn't be a founder. That's the worst. If that's the worst reason to do it, typically the best founders are do are, see founding a company as a means to an end. They want to bring some innovation, some new insight they had into the world, uh, and there's no, there's no one else that's going to do it. And there's this, as Cameron was talking about, there's this overwhelming urge that you you just you eat, you breathe, you sleep this problem, and you're you're the vehicle to bringing that into you know, into the world. And so that's that's the best reason to be a founder. And I think it's on us to provide the the means to make it less of a less of a risk, less scary. Uh, and I think if we do that, we'll see a lot more people realizing that they are capable, they are founders, because they've got these amazing ideas, uh, they've got these insights, and they've built some pretty cool stuff with them, so. My personal story is that I thought I wanted to be a professor for the first two and a half years of my PhD, and that's the track I was on, and my advisor was very happy with that. Um, we were making good progress towards it, and then uh, one of the research projects that I worked on was called Mesos, and started, we open sourced it. Uh, weren't necessarily thinking that it would become super popular or impact the world or technology, the scene, but it did It did start getting adoption. It got adopted at Twitter, it got adopted at Airbnb, and we were giving meetup talks at those companies to other people, smaller star, lots of small startups using it, and uh, I had some, some slow steps through those various conversations to realize the type of impact we were able to have through open source. And, uh, and started reconsidering, you know, like the chink in my armor, or like the seed was planted about like, wow, maybe the path to impact, which is at the core of my decision making and has been for since I was very young, like, well, how can I change the world the most? And so I've been optimizing that path. And at some point, the, that open source impact and then seeing how companies in the valley were using it and how those companies were painting the way for uh, technology and adoption for, you know, your mom and dad to be uh, having their lives changed. That flipped me at some point. Um, and then a subsequent open source project called Spark uh, sort of continued the momentum, and that became adopted at essentially the entire Fortune 5000 now and uh, led to Databricks. And so, yeah, I think I, I did convert at some point, but it was through this exposure to the impact I could have through means other than writing papers and gaming the, uh, the like academic conference scene. Yeah. <laughs>
Love it, love it. Just a quick, quick thought on that because, you know, so I, again, I'm an economist, but I kind of think about this as a demand pull story, right? It's sort of like he wasn't aiming at that. And yet the opportunity set was evolving. It's like, wow, 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 wow. And then, you know, all of a sudden it's like, yeah, this is, this is perfect. Uh, on the kind of, you can't be what you can't be. Who is that you can't see? Who is that person in your life that helped you to be what you can't see? That's a little bit more of a su supply side thing. Where all of a sudden it's like, well, maybe, 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 and how do I, how do, I do that? Um, so, so there's so many stories, but I, I, part of what I take from this is, yeah, well, let's kind of get disciplined about the story categories and then amplify every single one of them because it's like, if, if it, it, part of your comment was, look, if we're not intentional about this, the trend in kind of elevator parenting and other elements of society is going the opposite direction, right? And, and so, so we are fighting some, some currents here, even though we all like to talk about the gig economy and we're all entrepreneurs now. There are things happening among our young people in our selective colleges that are breeding some of this stuff out of the bone. Mm -hmm. I, I will quickly circle back to your question earlier, uh, Rich, about what can Berkeley be doing better? And it's not necessarily something Berkeley be doing better that is just a, a challenge which is there's a socioeconomic component to am I going to start a company or not and whether or not going to Google is, you know, a, a decent idea or an excellent idea. If you're coming from a disadvantaged background, making 200K out the gate as an engineer is, is not only life-changing, that could be an incredible moment for your family, um, and you're going to be less interested in building generational wealth or, you know, uh, being less focused on starting a company. Um, and it's, uh, it's not something that gets a lot of uh, airtime, but it's the first and only decision factor for a lot of people. Yeah, I want to build, I was going to mention something like that. I think it's important to look for little opportunities to, to help students who maybe goes, I can't work at a startup this summer, I have to make money. So yeah. um, we're just launching a scholarship program at Skydeck to, to fund interns who are from disadvantaged backgrounds. It's also important to show uh, people who, you know, not the typical entrepreneur, right? So, so a nice diverse group of people so that young women, young people of color can go, oh, that could be me. And, and these little things can make a very big difference. Great. So we're, we're, we're running out of time here. Any, any kind of last thoughts? You don't have to, but what, what, what happened? Can I, can I say one Oh, second? great. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So uh, since you're all Berkeley alums, uh, this has been very Berkeley focused, but, but particularly for Lenny and Amit, who see a lot of other universities, we have a lot of the uh, influential individuals in entrepreneurship here on campus. And what, if you look at other universities, what, what can someone like Rich or, or Caroline do uh, if you look compared to other universities, things, models that you see that they could be doing today institutionally to foster entrepreneurship? Something specific. Best practices. Well, I mean, first of all, like, you know, we all want Berkeley to be amazing, and we all, we, obviously, we spend our time thinking about how it could be better, but, like, it is worth recognizing, like, Berkeley's incredible, and the entrepreneurship outcomes are incredible, and, you know, a lot of that is due to the adjacency, A, the talent density that Carolyn referenced earlier, and the, the adjacency to Silicon Valley. I mean, there are a lot of folks from a lot of different universities in Silicon Valley, and they don't have, you know, nearly the relationship with the school. You know, part of that's just logistics and physics, you know? Um, I think the, you know, it was sort of referenced earlier that the sort of epicenter of Silicon Valley has shifted. And in the year 2010, I think it was, it kind of shifted to San Francisco, and now we're just kind of a quick Uber away. Um, but still, I think that there's a lot more we can do to, to engage with the community. I mean, I still feel, I don't know, I, I went to school, I graduated 20 years ago, my student ID number is 14823844, you know? <laughs> like, I mean, I'm sure some of you in the audience remember your student ID number. It's all I wrote on my midterms. I didn't even have to write my name, I think. Um, and we don't have as cohesive of an alumni group. That's the one thing I think that other folks do a much better job of. Mm -hmm. People from UPenn or any, you know, whatever peer university you may think of, they feel a deep camaraderie with their peers and they support each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, Berkeley referenced previously, like it's great. It's like a sink or swim culture and that's amazing because you have this grit and this tenacity and this sort of, you know, permissionless innovation mentality that comes out with it. But then, you know, entrepreneurship is lonely and it takes a village you know, to really, to really be successful. And so you know, that's something that I'm very proud of with, with the program that we do is like I'm sort of bootstrapping an alumni network and, you know, it's small scale. We only have 162 kids, but they, they're really well networked and there's long, longitudinal connectivity. So if you're a kid on campus, how do you meet someone who's four years ahead of you? I mean, there's effectively no way to do it, right? And so, you know, 
it's building that alumni network, and I think it's a responsibility for all of us uh, to do it in our own unique ways. I, I think that's spot on. I think creating the bridges to the alumni is, is a huge one. The other one that I would say is, um, and I'd say Berkeley's uh, fusion of, of research and industry is, I'd say it's, it's top two. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing that the, the university can do is build more connectivity to different pockets of innovation economies, whether it's YC here locally, whether it's other incubators and accelerators across the country, um, maybe even among different universities, uh, there's so many, uh, you know, there's so many interesting and, and, and pockets of innovation happening all across the country, all across the world. Getting Berkeley involved in those directly, I think, can uh, can really inspire. I have a very specific recommendation: Berkeley take back the alumni association and bring it back internally to campus, mm -hmm. and not outsource that to a separate org. Yeah. To, yeah. Those yeah. who don't know, it's, it's effectively Berkeley's got a separate 501c3 of the California Alumni Association. Mm -hmm. Very, very few universities run, run that way. Yeah. Great answers, great questions. Mm -hmm. I think we have to we have to call it a day. This I I learned a ton. Thank you very, very much, Thank panelists. You.